There's lots of different parts of Christmas that we can draw from in our shows. And I think that's why it comes across as natural and because we are drawing on real things for us. It's not tinsel town. And I do think that as Canadians, there's something about our climate where we live and the expanse of the land. We do share there's things about the Christmas season and the darkness that comes and how it's so important for people to experience the comforts of home cooking, the smells, the sights, the lights, the sounds. These are things that get us through the dark months. I think it lifts us through December, as the old song goes, if we make it through December. I'm Peter McCulley. That's Lucy and Stuart McNeil of the Barra McNeils, who have been crisscrossing Canada with their Christmas tour for almost 25 years. We'll talk about the family group when Today in BC continues. Why spend hours searching dealerships, comparing makes and models? Find the best of BC's inventory in one place, todaysdrive.com. You'll have access to inventory across BC, where you can easily find a vehicle that fits your needs and gets you where you need to go in comfort. Get in the driver's seat. Don't miss out on the many options we have available for you. Powered by Black Press Media, todaysdrive.com connects you with exclusive new and used car deals. Multi-award winning musicians, the Barra McNeils, hail from Sydney Mines on Cape Breton Island and are widely regarded as Canada's Celtic ambassadors. They've won a gold album, Juno's, East Coast Music Awards over the course of their 17 albums. Thanks to Lucy and Stuart for making time for us today. Kimmer Mahal. Leva. Kimmer Mahal Hain. Tell me about growing up in Cape Breton. Was music a big part of your youth? It certainly was. There was a lot of live music in our house, and, and also, especially at our mother's house, there was a lot of fiddlers and step dancers, and our mom played piano. They had the first piano in the community, so it was a real gathering spot. We have a lot of uh, very positive memories of growing up, and we were always encouraged to play a little music. Everyone had a little party favor that they did, and it certainly had a profound effect on us. As Stuart said, growing up, our uncles played fiddles and sang and uh, great storytellers. And so there was lots of laughs and music. And our mother, as he said, was probably the only piano player at, at some of these evenings. And she'd have to play for everyone, all the different fiddlers. And her back would be pretty sore. But she said her sisters would be upset. They said she just does that so she wouldn't have to be in the kitchen washing dishes. Or <laughs> so sometimes when you know how you have another skill, it's helpful. But yeah, growing up was a lot of music and a lot of fun. Lucy, you were only 10 years old when you joined your brothers, Seamus, Kyle and Stuart on stage to perform. Yeah, I ran there somewhere. I started taking violin lessons when I was nine, but I'd already knew how to step dance because our mother was a step dance teacher. And being younger than the Seamus, Kyle and Stuart, so I'm four years behind Stuart. And uh, mom used to have a eight-hand reel. So there was Stuart was in it and then other kids from Sydney Mines, and one of them wasn't available. I was the stand-in, so you learned how to do a lot of different things that way. I remember when I went to university, though, I still wasn't 19 yet, but they were playing, and I got to university, and I think the first weekend I headed by train to Halifax and uh, and played the lower deck, and I was underage, but didn't matter. Those are fun days. We started out playing a lot of uh, local concerts and square dances. Uh, Kyle and Seamus started playing at dances. Kyle was... 14 years old and he'd play a full night of dances and I think that really attributes so much to the strength of his playing today and it's somewhere in there I joined in I started playing Penny Whistle I think I heard Dennis Ryan playing a Penny Whistle and as the story goes John Ferguson dropped one off he was at uh, our house with a friend of ours John Gillis from Southwest Marguerite and uh, music went on that night and John forgot his whistle and when he came back to get it, he said, I couldn't take it away. He said he was playing it. <laughs> John Gillis left a Boran, and then That's I started right. playing the Boran as well. So yeah. I said, you can't leave anything with those fellas. <laughs> <laughs> I think we really built in a real band sense. We are multi-instrumentalists, and a lot of that just came from, we think, what would be nice to add in? And like in my case, I knew I didn't want to play fiddle because everybody in Cape Breton played fiddle, but I, I knew the, t- the tunes in my head as well as anybody 
and uh, the whistle, and eventually the wooden Irish Irish flute, they call it. It's basically the old system of the classical players used to play, and then somehow the Irish got their hands on them when they switched over to the slicker uh, silver instrument. But those instruments, I started playing along with Kyle and learning the tunes to play to complement the sound. And I think in many ways, it was a color element that I thought was important to bring into Cape Breton music to just to give it not even a new spin, but just a slightly different spin. We all played different instruments, and I should also mention that we went to Mount Allison University. The first four of us did. Lucy studied violin, Kyle studied violin. Mm-hmm. I was a piano major. I don't play much piano on stage, but the piano is still one thing that I love playing. And Seamus was a pipe organ major at Mount Allison. It was a good experience going to Mount A and the lifelong connections that we've made. And it just gave you just a broader sense of where your music fit into the scope of world music. When you studied at Mount Allison, did you study other subjects among the music courses? Yeah, and majored in yeah. studied music in. and majored in our instruments. So majored in violin, fiddle. Phylogeny and ontogeny. <laughs> that was one of the psych courses I took. I remember I passed in a paper, and I, I think I got a good mark on it, and Dr. Henry James, he was an English chap, and he said, you seem to understand the subject quite well, but your spelling is atrocious. And has that come in handy on stage with the band? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> More so when we're traveling in the vehicle. <laughs> yes. yes. That's not your only experience with university. The Barry McNeils have honorary doctorates from Cape Breton University. Well, yeah, we we're very fortunate. We, when we got notified that we were going to be presented and robed and had and all the regalia for honorary doctorates, and because you feel it's very humbling. Yeah. And still, uh, Kyle teaches some fiddle classes at yeah. Cape Breton University, and the university there is really flourishing now. There's a huge international base of students, mm-hmm. and in general, Cape Breton, I think, right now is uh, certainly going through some sort of a renaissance. I think just. A lot of good things economically and culturally. The interest in learning more about our cultures, it seems to be definitely on the rise. So this would be the third revival. There was the first one, and then we met in the 80s when there was the second one, and that's when... You know, the Rankins and Natalie McMaster and Ashley McIsaac were all enjoying uh, some profile right across the country. It depends on who you are when you say <laughs> revival, because some of us live it all the time. That's right. Yeah, this, that's is, right. this is 36 years on the road, and we're still doing... That's what I was going to ask you, is that well, we met in the 80s, and you've been on the road ever since. And so literally, you've been around the globe playing music. So I wanted you to tell me about some of the great places you played. <sighs> so many. And it doesn't even have to be a grand theater. It can be a little hole in the wall, but you can have experience with people and you just never characters. Know. We're a fan of characters. We like we like a good story and we like a good character. We've met yeah. a few over the years. Yeah, we've played uh, Southern Destinations. Barbados. I think so. Yeah, Barbados. <laughs> that was fun. That was a lot of fun. We've been up to the, some of the northern communities a few times, and that was very interesting. We were up to a festival called uh, Tunic Time. We uh, wrote a, a piece to, to dedicate it to that trip, and it was quite amazing. We did two different events. One was at the most northerly Elks Club in the world. This was <laughs> in Akalo. Yeah. And that was a great event. There was people from mainly southerners, I guess. The next day, we played a show, and all the local elders came out. They say that it was an honor to have all these people out there. I remember the fascination they had with Lucy playing the boron. The, Very similar the drum, to their drums. The frame drums. Mine was goat skin, but there's a seal skin. And uh, the festival, the uh, Frostbite Festival. I was, I don't know, how old was I then? I it was know. in the early 90s, maybe? Just out of university. But it was lots of different kinds of music and yeah. uh, and we were billeted with all mm-hmm. these different people really yeah. nice people we saw the aurora borealis at night it was just incredible. just amazing the color and and all night music just <laughs> to get people through the, the dark months it was in february and i think the festival still goes on it's, it's the first it's, time i saw ani defranco i was pretty right. impressed with yeah, her she was very new on the scene at that time and we played at easter time up in pervinatuk Northern Quebec. Yes, around the Hudson Bay. And that was pretty amazing. You could see in that community that when you looked out on the ice, they had the teams of Huskies. They brought them back because at one point, white man knowing so much said, oh, you won't be needing to do that now. You have skidoos. And I think what happened after a few years, they got very depressed. 
and they realized that this was a big part of their culture. But to be there and see the ice sculpting right out on the bay was just spectacular. And then going to the gig that night and there'd be 200 snowmobiles at the hall. (laughs) And you know what? If we weren't in a band, have any of these experiences. We'd never travel to these places. These are not the highlighted places where you hear people talk about everyone's, are you going south? Are you going? But being in a band and traveling, you get into these places that you never would on your own. That's how I feel anyway. Mm-hmm. Do you run into Cape Breitners wherever you go? Oh, yes. Most definitely. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> that must make you feel at home. Oh, yeah. It does. It's really, it's amazing the how people can tie in a story that somehow you share from growing up and it's a pretty pretty small world i remember one time the first time we were in scotland we were in the isle of sky and there was a scottish country dance going and the place was wide open and never saw anything like it at one point there was a couple they were pretty aggressive dancers and one of them went off the wall and <laughs> she was okay though she was she got up and she kept going but there was a man we met and uh, he said so you're from cape breton he said i'm from cape breton what part of cape breton are you from Sydney Mines. My mother still lives in Sydney Mines. Cambridge Avenue. Oh, is that right? That Cambridge Avenue is right behind our house. We live on Clyde Avenue. He said, you're the McNeil boys who my mother used to talk about. You used to do all the yard work for her. Her name was... Mr. Mow the Lawn, yeah. That's right. Mrs. Scott. And he lived in Ohio. And he could not believe it. He traveled to another continent to find out that the McNeil boys who did the yard work were on stage. (laughs) When we're sitting down to chat here today, you're starting 36 shows on the road in 38 days. That must be a logistical challenge given the number of you that there is. Nine traveling. We have a good crew. We do. This is only the second day. Yesterday was the first day. We were delighted to be met at the hotel by a lovely dog named Barkley. And a pretty old dog, so he wasn't too excited. But it was just really cool to come in after you're dead tired and this dog is there <laughs> wagging yeah. his tail and... this tour is pretty well a show a day there are numerous days that there are double sh- shows that have been added across the country we're just really excited we haven't been out west for a few years they're seeing people are starting to come out again starting to get a little braver and uh, we're really happy and i guess we're being very brave we bought a couple of boxes of masks and stuff just (laughs) and trying to uh, stay healthy and taking our vitamins and but when you have this ahead of you you can't think too much about it because you you'll have a panic attack and that's where the psychology course comes (laughs) yes for sure but we just got to get in the groove you get in the groove of and it's like a groundhog day every day is pretty much the same you don't get to go do a lot of sightseeing and wasting your energy. you got to conserve your energy. We're all getting a little older, and uh, it's a bit like taking a gentleman's hockey team across the country. Every day somebody gets up and then, oh, my back is sore. And, oh, you got to stretch it out. <laughs> Question for you. Do you have a videographer with you on this tour? Because Lucy traveling with five brothers in a band, it seems to me that that's a really good reality show. Oh, it probably would. <laughs> Yeah, but we don't have one. No, we just have our own little phones, and we do little snippets now and then. I do a lot of the stuff, and Boyd's pretty good, but we're... Social media, yeah. Social media, and I'm going to try to convince them to do a little more of it this time, so people can watch along the way and get a sense of what it's like. Do any members of the Barry McNeils have children, and are they picking up the music and the culture along the way as well? Oh, yeah. Sh- Seamus has three, and I have two daughters and a stepson but Seamus's three are playing a lot and his oldest boy Malcolm is studying his third year at St. of X the jazz program he's a great guitar player but he's back into the fiddle again with Cape Breton style and, and learning lots of tunes and he's very much into it and uh, performing with different people and Mariana plays fiddle and John Angus plays fiddle and percussion and my two play fiddle and piano and then my stepson he likes listening <laughs> But uh, he likes dancing, but he won't admit it. But they're into other things. But they all enjoy it. We're all together. They'll get up and give a step. Everybody can has a little bit of a step in them. So, in Cape Breton, you're born with that, don't you have? It? I do. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. I just don't know where I put it. Oh, <laughs> I've lost it somewhere along the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, do the kids speak any Gaelic? Actually, Malcolm, I think, has taken a class at Saint of X. His friends that are there, and uh, he's had a girlfriend now. That's very much into the traditional language and dancing and playing. So that's always great when your kids can get involved with other kids that find it fun and exciting and 
Keep it going. When Today in BC continues, we'll chat more with Lucy and Stuart McNeil and listen into a Christmas tune from the Barra McNeils. Hey, it's the Moj, Bob Marjanovic. Join me on the Moj on Sports podcast on Black Press Media at todayinbc.com. Listen into conversations with well-known athletes and celebrities as we look behind the scenes at these successful people. Listen in to the Moj on Sports podcast on todayinbc.com. You'll also find the Moj on Sports podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, YouTube, and Google Podcasts, as well as mojonsports.com. Today in BC is a Black Press Media podcast. I'm Peter McCulley. As we mentioned, the Barry McNeils have been doing this a long time, and that speaks both to the success of the band and the multi-generations that come out to the shows. I always find it interesting, uh, people that we talk to and they say, my parents used to take me to the Christmas shows uh, 20 years ago, and now they're unable to make it out to the show on their own, so we get the tickets and we take them out. And it's become very much that uh, a real family outing for uh, multiple generations. I think it's a testament to the strength of the music, the culture, it's tradition to a certain degree. Like what we do is based on a strong tradition from the, the Gaelic and fiddling, the family end of things and step dancing, but it's much more than that. A lot of times, the only way I can sum it up is it, it fluctuates between Cape Breton Kitchen Party and Midnight Mass. And it certainly is that, that element that between the two that because there are very there are very ruckus moments in the show, but there's also very poignant moments where some of the music there's not a dry eye in the audience. Yeah. Sentimental favorites. And also the I should really mention the Family vocals, it's hard to buy that if you're not a family. We do have a certain distinction in the way we sound, and it seems to get better over the years. Because we're very fortunate to have Seamus, who's got a fabulous bass voice, and then Kyle is a baritone. I'm a baritone tenor type of thing, and now and then I have some pretty eg type of <laughs> harmonies to, to fit in with what Lucy sings. Boyd as well sings, and Boyd is a fascinating talent. He's very, very polished string player, both in your bazooki and, and fiddle. But also he plays, uh, the, the, the idea of adding instruments, uh, he plays a Brazilian instrument called the pandero. And we were fortunate to meet one of the world's most famous pandero players when we recorded in Nashville, Closer to Paradise, and with, in our polygram days. And he played that on some of the traditional melt music tracks. It was so similar to the Brazilian traditional music mm. and now Boyd plays that instrument and it's just it's a marvel how many instruments he plays and also he's known for his wit he's a pretty dry guy but back to the people that are coming to the shows we have people that are from the east coast they don't have from cape breton or pei or new brunswick newfoundland if they can't get home it's that feeling like they've been home for a couple hours and uh, gets them in the christmas spirit but we also have people that come up to us after the shows and they have no connection to the East Coast, but they really felt like they were part of the family, like we invited them into our home for an evening. And uh, and some, this, um, I don't go to church, but what you presented tonight, I have got a good message from it, and we're not trying to be preachy in any way, but I think the repertoire, how we talk to each other, it's just like that feeling of being there for each other and being good to each other, and that's basically what it is, and you have fun doing it, and people take a lot home with that. In the Celtic music world, the Bears are regarded as one of the best live Celtic shows out there, and I can attest to that because I've seen you many times. Do you have different shows for different audiences, like geographically or culturally? You mentioned Barbados. Would that, except for Christmas and your regular show, would it change at all? No, I think it's probably more a case of the show evolves with time, like what we were doing. There are certainly elements of the show that we do keep in the show, I remember there was a point when we took the Cold Town Road, uh, Kyle sings out. It's a real anthem, and there was one tour that we didn't put it in. It was a long time ago, and the audiences were up in arms. People were saying, I didn't hear the Cold Town Road tonight. (laughs) And so you do have to respect that we've been doing this a long time, and there are songs that we always keep in the show, but there's also new elements as well. 
Traditional music, it, it always amazes me how deep the well is. But unfortunately, we're losing a lot of the older torchbearers. And uh, it's so important today to make sure you get good recordings of these people and, and get both in the language element of things, as if you're learning Gaelic in particular, but also in the music side of it and just the way things are presented because music should change. It shouldn't just be the same. And I think part of our success is that We've changed it enough to make it our own. And also, it's constantly evolving. Sometimes it has more traditional elements. Sometimes it has a song element that takes you in a different direction. But for sure, that Cape Breton traditional music is the core of it. For folks that haven't been to a proper kitchen party, or Kaylee, I thought that the album In Session did a great job of transporting the listener to a live Kaylee. Yeah, we went to a governor's pub. We invited our family and closest friends and closed it for us. And, and we had to get a, an upright piano upstairs. I think they put it in through a window or something. Yes. Yeah, because there's a winding staircase there, governors. And so there was no way you'd get a piano up the stairs. So we put in a little bit of an effort, but we had a great day of recording. And it was just like a house party, only a little bit bigger than our home. We played music for them and they responded and people got up dancing and hooting and hollering and listening it, a lot of listening as well but it was uh, I know it was great a, a lot of people that's their favorite because when they don't live in Cape Breton and when they hear all that chatter in the background and the familiar voices and the little laughs and stuff here and there it just relaxes them mm-hmm. makes them feel like they're home <laughs>
you've recorded three Christmas albums and been touring Christmas concerts for many years. I'm guessing Christmas was a big part of growing up at home. Our mother really liked Christmas. She always talks about when she was very young. She remembers her mother talking about at midnight at Christmas. They had a little farm, so all the animals would kneel at midnight. She's a very great storyteller, our mother, great explaining things, and we always tried to get her to write more. She would put great images in your mind about Christmas, and then, of course, their Christmases were full of music. They were a family, and they all played and had gatherings. The Mackenzie household was a gathering place. People went there. They knew they were going to hear music and laughter, and our uncle Hector was a great storyteller. He wrote funny songs. And, and we went there as children. We went up to our grandmother's place, and, and we would see all these people and see our cousins. So then we would have that part of our Christmas, but we also have our own Christmas at Sydney Mines. And then we got older, we were all involved in choir. My mother was involved in the adult choir. The boys were in the boys' choir. I was in the girls' junior choir. So we were going to different masses to sing. When the, the McNeil boys, before I came along, they would play at different functions, concerts and things, before I got involved with them. But there's lots of different parts of Christmas that we can draw from in our shows. And I think that's why it comes across as natural and because we are drawing on real things for us. It's not tinsel town. And I do think that as Canadians, there's something about our climate, where we live, and the expanse of the land. We do share, there's things about the Christmas season and the darkness that comes Mm -hmm. and how it's so important for people to experience the comforts of home cooking, the smells, the sights, the lights, the sounds. These are things that get us through the dark months. I think it lifts us through December As the old song goes, if we make it through December, it's like when we get to the end of the year, we sort of just take stock and say, ah, c'est la vie, that's Shanakata, that's it. We move on to the new year and somehow these traditions have sustained us through time. And it's really about, as Canadians, I think we do share that. that It's very much a time of of darkness and there's no better way than to, to share those traditions to bring a little bit of light during dark times. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin.
Thanks for your time today. It's been great. What's next for you two and the Barra McNeils besides 35 more stops? Besides 35 more stops. <laughs> what will 2023 bring? Wow, 2023. I have a solo project that's kind of coming up in 23 nice. that I've been working on since many years and just sometimes it, when you're working together as a band and a well-oiled thing and then you're trying to do so, something you just want to do for your own interest it's a solo recording okay. yeah it's a lovely so. project see there's some great music on it and lucy's husband rob durando plays with her on the album and it's it really is a work of love and it's something people can certainly look forward to Stuart helped he produce it I have other family members that I twisted their arm to come and help me out. <laughs> but I've, I have two daughters and they're singing some backgrounds for me. So it takes a while when you're trying to grab people from the family and everybody's busy lives. So it's a work of love, as he said, and I can't wait for people to hear it. I'd like to thank Lucy and Stuart McNeil of the Barra McNeils for being with us on this edition of Today in BC. If you have suggestions or comments, send a voice message to podcast at blackpress.ca. You may be part of our podcast mailbag segment. You'll find Today in BC podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and Google Podcasts.